Leviticus chapter 19 and chapter 20. This is part two of loving what God loves. Loving what God loves. You know, we've been talking a whole lot about rules. You know, we've covered a, a lot of actually uh, of the law. You know, we've been doing Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And, you know, sometimes it's easy. You're just kind of sitting there and you're like, man, these rules don't apply to me. And you're just kind of, you're like, what, what's the deal with all these rules? And I, I got some news for you. One of the top questions at Faith Baptist Bible College is, why do we have that rule? Why does that rule have to exist? You know, what I can watch, what I can wear, you know, why I can't stay up past a certain time. You know, a lot of the faith students, you know, they, they find sometimes they kind of flirt with the rule, like they get close to the line, but they're like, I, I didn't break it. They kind of find the loopholes. You meet a lot of those. And you know, some of them, you know, break the rules, but you know, they know their RA is so merciful. They know they're going to get away with it. You know, some, you know, to try and keep some of the rule breaking under the rug, you know, they do with their friends, they try and hide it. And because they're like, what, what's the point of the rule? Why do we have it? And you know, the, the dean of students, the student life, you know, they've also often had to answer this question year after year and after year. And what I appreciated, one of our uh, dean of students, uh, Noah Kephart, uh, some of you know him, uh, one of the things he said, he said, you know, it'd be nice if we didn't have all those rules. You know, it'd be nice if we didn't have to have all these rules to follow. But he says, you know what? We have this problem. We have this problem that we don't always love God and we don't always love others. I mean, think how easy it would be if we could just go through life and not have a bunch of rules to follow. I mean, if we could just love God and love others as we're supposed to, it'd be so much easier if we just had two commandments. And we see Jesus give those two commandments as the greatest above all. That you are to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And he says the second is like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. And actually that second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, comes from our passage today. Levit Leviticus 19. Jesus is quoting this passage. But the thing is, the reason why God has given rules to the people of Israel and why we have rules in the New Testament is because the rules are to be a guide. They're to be a guide in how we are to love God and how we are to love others. You know, we were talking about Genesis uh, with the teens, about our identity. And the thing is, we actually see God setting in order these rules. We see him setting in these different orders. You know, it talks about in Genesis 1-2 that the earth was out without form and void. This idea of chaos. And then you have the creation week, though, where God's setting in order how things are meant to be. And we, got, we see that God sets man as created in his image. We see that God commands mankind to, to have dominion over the earth, to subdue it. We see that man is, has been given boundaries even all the way in a perfect world. We see in a perfect world that God has given these boundaries so that man would have a right relationship with him. A right relationship with one another. You know, Genesis 2 talks about how the husband and wife are one flesh. And, you know, also talks about man's, you know, relationship with all of creation. To have dominion, to subdue it. Even in a perfect world, there were rules. And God gave, you know, one of the famous rules that a lot of people knew, know. That Adam and Eve were not supposed to eat of one tree. But the thing is, they did. And we see relationship broken in the garden. We see that Adam and Eve are removed from God's presence, from paradise, this perfect world. They were removed from God. That relationship was damaged. You know, it talks about how husband and wife, you know what, there's going to be conflict in the home now. The relationship with one another was broken. And even talks about how the earth was going to bring up thorns and thistles when Adam was going to try and plow the ground. All the relationship because of one rule was broken, so was relationship broken. 
We need proper relationship. We need proper relationship. If we are going to love what God loves, we need to have a right relationship with God and with others. And we need to understand the seriousness of breaking that relationship with God and with people. So what groundwork has God laid down so that we can be holy in His sight? Go to Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am, am holy. You know, it's the continued theme in Leviticus that the people of Israel were to be set apart from the nations, that they were to be set apart from sin, that they were to be like their God. And the thing is, the way they were going to do this was to be showing love to one another and towards God. This was going to be one of the ways they would be holy. And you know, what's interesting is that 16 times the Lord says, I am the Lord. And it's kind of like, okay, God, we know your name. It's been mentioned quite a bit here. But it's showing that this is supposed to be reminding the people of Israel, this is the Lord who made a covenant with you. You need to be obeying this. And at the very end of the passage, and we'll kind of cover it again, but verse 37, it says, Therefore, you shall observe all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them. I am the Lord. How the people of Israel were going to be holy, how they were going to love God and love others, God has laid down this foundation, this groundwork, with these rules to be a guide. And this is what love looks like. So our first point for tonight is we need to be other-minded. We need to be other-minded. Now, what, what do I mean by that? I mean, I think we've heard the phrase, you know, often it's connected with Philippians to this idea of other-mindedness. And often we connect it with people. I need to be other-minded to people. But I think Scripture also has this idea that we need to be other-minded towards God. That we need to be thinking, what does God want from this situation? What does God want from my life? And you know, and as the people of Israel are hearing these laws, they need to be thinking, how do I be separate from what the nations are doing so that we are doing what God wants? And other-minded also means that we need to be other-minded towards what people need. Now, notice I changed a few words there. I said what God wants. What God wants is always good. So we, can, we should always be doing that. But we need to do what people need. People's wants are always good. But we need to be other-minded to what their needs are and how we obey them. And one of the first things that God says, all the way in verse 3, Leviticus 19, verse 3, Everyone, you shall revere his mother and his father. The very first commandment. My dad loves this commandment a lot. This word revere is also the word honor, and it also has the idea of to fear. So kids, I need to look at me here. I need all of your eyes. Oh, there we go. To fear, you need to be scared of your parents. You need to be fearful, run away from them. They're scary people. No, that's not what it's talking about. This idea, revere to honor, man, you should have a desire to want to obey your parents. Man, you know, and the Bible talks about one day you might have to take care of your parents as they get older. I mean, this idea that, man, you want to serve your parents and that, guess what, you're not going to speak poorly about them, that you're not going to disobey them. And actually, if you look in chapter 20, it actually talks about those who are rebellious against their parents are to be stoned, to be killed. So we have a stoning pit out there, so parents, afterwards, if we have any naughty kids, we can take them out that way. I'm kidding. We're not under the law anymore, and kids, are, kids all around the world are very thankful for that. <laughs> but we see the very first law is that you revere his mother and his father. And why is this one given first? And I don't know if we necessarily know why, but we see that the mother and father are an authority that God has given to the family. They're supposed to lead the home in godliness. 
And God holds parents accountable to make sure that their children are reared in the ways of the Lord. And this is why God is calling children to revere their parents. Because they're supposed to be going in the way of godliness and guiding their children that way. And God's saying, you know what, because they're going in the way of godliness, you need to follow as well. That you need to revere them, to obey them, to listen to them. Not to profane their name because they are supposed to be leading you towards righteousness. And then the second thing in the verse, it says, keep my Sabbaths. And we'll be coming back to that because it's actually something that's repeated. So that's always something important to remember. It's something that's repeated. There's a lot of application today, guys. So verse 4, do not turn to idols, nor make for yourselves molded gods. I am the Lord your God. Now some of these first verses you might recognize, oh, this is part of the Ten Commandments. This is something that's in the Ten Commandments, and God actually kind of command, uh, puts two of, the, two, two of the Ten Commandments together. You know, that you're not supposed to be going after other idols, and that you're not supposed to be making for yourselves molded gods. Now, a lot of you are thinking right now, you know, I don't worship a lot of gods in my home. You know, I, I, don't, I can't think of the last time I've made a god out of wood or out of metal or something like that. And we try and remove ourselves from that, like, whew, don't have to worry about that commandment. But you know what happens in our culture a lot of the time? You know, I've actually seen it. People are like, oh, man, I bring my Bible with me everywhere. It's kind of like their good luck charm. They're kind of like, man, as long as I have my Bible with me, nothing bad's going to happen. So, you know, some people wear a cross around their necks thinking that somehow the power of God is being displayed through that. And sometimes, you know, we get this weird spiritual, like, oh, man, this thing, because it represents something from the Bible, has some special spiritual power to it. And the thing is, God is not found in anything, I mean, we see the people of Israel make this mistake, and actually Aaron kind of leading the charge. They, they make a golden calf, and, and Aaron says, hey, look it, this is the God who brought you out of, out of Egypt. And the thing is, we can do the same in that we, something that God is doing, we give credit to something else. We give credit to something else that, man, even though God did it, and the thing is, God is the one who only deserves your worship. There shouldn't be anything in our life. And you know what? The scary thing is, sometimes we're our own idol. Man, we're all about me. Man, we like to receive recognition when we do something, don't we? And we're not to make for ourselves a God. It's only God who is to be worshipped, to receive all praise. Then we come to verses 5 through 8. And if you offer a sacrifice, a, a peace offering to the Lord, you shall offer it of your own free will. It shall be, be eaten the same day you offer it. And on the next day, if any remains until the third day, it shall be burned in the fire. And if it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an abomination. It shall not be accepted. Therefore, everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity, because he has profaned the hallowed offering of the Lord. And that person shall, cut off, shall be cut off from his people. You know, we talked about this a little bit last week. This idea of, of a peace offering. The peace offering was a little bit different than a lot of the other offerings in that, you know what? The people of Israel, Israel was supposed to offer it out of their free will. When, they were, when God was doing something in their life and they're thankful for it. They're supposed to be thankful towards God. And you know what? This is an offering that God's not even forcing on the people of Israel. He's not saying, hey, at this time, make sure you give thanksgiving. But what he's saying is that, man, out of your free will... You give a peace offering to the Lord. And the thing with the peace offering is that the people of Israel were allowed to eat of this offering until the third day when it, it was to be burned. 
and it would be considered an abomination. And guess what? The offering wouldn't be accepted as an offering as Thanksgiving if they did eat the meat on the third day or any day past that. And in these verses, we're seeing that, man, God is calling the people of Israel, man, I want you to be selfless givers. You guys need to be selfless givers. I mean, we see that in that God says, you know what? I want you to give of your own free will. You know, too often as believers, you know, a lot of churches are, behave this way as well. You know what? We just want to obey as much as the letter of the law says. You know, like, uh, you know, I only have to give about this much or I only have to do about this much. I'm not going to go beyond that. But here we see God talks about this offering. He says to give of your own free will. Are you a thankful people? Are we a thankful people? Are we ones that, man, we're so thankful for what God is doing and how he's provided for us that we want to give everything to him? And the thing is, we see that they're supposed to be so selfless that, man, if there's any meat left after the third days, that they're supposed to burn it. Now imagine that. Some good meat you're seeing there, and guess what? It needs to be burned up. They're not supposed to be selfish in that they're supposed to take it. But that it's completely dedicated to the Lord and thanksgiving. We need to be selfless givers. And just because you're a giver doesn't mean you're a selfless one. I mean, think of Ananias and Sapphira. We see them sell their property, and, you know, they tell the church, guess what? This is everything we sold, we gave to the church. We gave it all. We gave it all up, but guess what? They held some back. And actually, God was okay with that. God doesn't punish Ananias and Sapphira because they held some back, but because they lied about it. And it's kind of hard to tell exactly why they did it, but good chance they went in good standing among the people. Man, look how we gave it all. But the theme was they lied, and, got, and it says in Acts that they lied to the Holy Spirit, to God himself. They were not selfless givers. See, God desires, at times, offerings of free will. Men, that we're giving it because we're thankful to the Lord and no other reason. And to give according to how we want to give to the Lord. And that we're not supposed to be boastful about it. Or that we want to gain something out of it. But it's totally dedicated to God. And that we're thankful towards Him. And then we come to verses 9 through 10. And as we go through this passage, you know, we're talking about loving God, loving others. There's a big mixture. There will be some verses where you're like, okay, that's more about loving God. That's more about loving others. And I could have split them up, but I kind of want us to go through the flow of the passage and see how all, all these things connect. So verses 9 through 10. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. And you shall not glean Glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. What story does this sound like? Josh, you know. Ruth. Yes, when I was reading this, I'm like, oh, this sounds a lot like Ruth. We have Boaz who is obeying this law. We have a law for the poor and the stranger. Man, imagine, I mean, we're Iowans here. You know, we live in farming country. Imagine if the government one day was like, guys, you guys can harvest all you want, but guess what? The corners of your fields, don't, don't, don't touch that. That's for uh, the poor and the stranger coming into your land. I mean, I think as Iowans, we'd be like, no, that's, that's my crops. It's a valuable commodity. But God wanted the people of Israel to show love and that they were willing to give up what they had for the poor. And it's important to remember, and the stranger, someone who is a foreigner to the land, which we see happen in the book of Ruth. Now, the people of Israel weren't supposed to be all about business. To get out as much out of their land as they possibly can but they were supposed to leave a portion to give to those in need. 
to be looking out to that. And you know what's amazing about the story of Boaz is that he actually goes beyond what he was told. Yes, he left the corners, but guess what? He also tells his guys, you know what? For Ruth, leave some extra grain for her. It wasn't that the people of Israel were supposed to just do this for the poor, but they were supposed to be so generous in that they wanted to go beyond. That they, could, that they wanted to give to this. That the people of their land, they weren't just like, ah, stay away from those guys. Man, that, oh man, can't believe, it. man, I just want to stay away from them. They're bums, they're coming on my land. They're supposed to be looking towards, how can I love even the lowest of the low? And you know what? The stranger, someone who's a foreigner, I mean, we see in the New Testament, Israelites had a disgust for those who were outside the nation of Israel. But God did not create that to be. He says, even those who are in your land, who aren't originally from there, they are supposed to provide for them as well. And then we get to verses 11 through 18. Verses 11 through 18. We see how the people of Israel were supposed to treat their neighbor. And it's important to remember at this point, who is your neighbor? And Jesus actually clarifies this in the Gospels. You know, because the people of Israel had this idea of, okay, who's your neighbor? You know, you know, it's probably the person close to you. You know, it's the people of Israel. You know, it's probably the person you like a whole lot that you get along with. But Jesus says that, you know what, who's your neighbor? Guess what? It's everybody. Everyone that God brings along into your path. It's even those who you consider to be your enemies. I mean, Jesus gives the parable of the Good Samaritan. The one who took care of a Jew. The one who would be considered his enemy. And so the people of Israel are supposed to be showing this goodness, this kindness to all. So in verse 11, it says, You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. And then in verse 12, it says, And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. These two verses focus a little bit more on our words and how we use them with one another. It starts off, though, with you shall not steal. Whatever your, is your neighbor's is your neighbor's. It's not yours. It says, nor deal falsely. There should be in no way that you are trying to deceive your neighbor. You know, I've met a lot of kids, and I think we do this too. You know, well, what I said wasn't technically a lie. You know, sometimes we try and use our words. We use multiple words. We're trying to, we're not saying the full truth, but we want to use our words to guide them away so that we don't get in trouble about something. I've, I've met a lot of campers that way. And, you know, they're like, but the thing is, you shall not deal falsely at all with your neighbor. That you're trying to trick or deceive them or lead them away from the truth. The truth should be open with your neighbor. It says, nor lie to one another. And then it gets into, and you shall not swear by na my name falsely. This is getting into, you know what, Israel, don't make a promise by the name of the Lord and not keep it. Any promise that you make, and especially when it's given in connection with, with the name of the Lord, you better keep that promise. And then it gets in, nor shall you profane the name of your God, nor take it in vain. Now it's important to remember that God cannot be tainted by sin. God's essence, He, he is always holy. But the thing is, God's name we should have a desire that nothing be attached to it that is sinful. That when people think of God, they don't think of man. They think of sin in some way that, man, God's people, they, they, they swear by his name, but guess what? They don't keep their promise. Man, that they take God's name in vain, that somehow they tear it down a level. God's name is to be sacred. And you know what? We need to have a desire that God's name be kept from profanity. And the thing is, sometimes we think it's just good enough that I don't say it. And it's good that we don't say it. 
But the thing is, man, we shouldn't be watching things, listening to things, reading to things that, man, they're willing to take the Lord's name in vain as much as they want. We should try and stay away from those things. And there's times where we need to stay away from certain people. You know what's scary at times? When people, you're around certain people so much and they're taking God's name in vain, sometimes you start thinking of those things. It comes to mind. And we should want to stay away from that. But in these two verses, we need to remember, use your words wisely. And truthfully, don't try to deceive your neighbor in any way. Don't be making a promise that you're not planning to keep, especially connected with the Lord, and that we shouldn't say anything that would bring the name of our God down. Our words need to be used wisely. And then verses 13 through 14, you shall not cheat your neighbor, nor rob him. In these two verses, we're going to see that anything that belongs to somebody else needs to go to that person. And so you have this idea of not to cheat your neighbor. You know what? If you borrowed something from your neighbor, make sure it goes back to them. That you're not taking anything of yours or taking advantage of them in any way. And it says, The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. This verse is getting after, you know what, if you owe somebody money, especially it's getting owing after the hired hand, if it's their money, make sure it doesn't even stay with you till morning. Imagine if your job one day just said, you know what, your paycheck is coming next week instead of this week. If they withheld their money. And what the Lord is saying here is that anything that rightly belongs to them, make sure you're not holding on to it. That it goes to them. And then verse 14, you shall not curse the death, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God. I am the Lord. Now verse 14 is a little weird, because, I mean, I think the first thing I thought of, I'm like, are the Israelites just going around, like, yelling at the deaf, you know, cursing them, and then trying to throw things in front of the blind? Well, God is actually just going to the extreme here. It's not like the people of Israel were like, man, we're going around. We're, I, and the thing is, maybe some of them were, but this is an extreme example. And what he's getting is that you shouldn't take advantage of those who have a weakness. You shouldn't be taking advantage of those who have a weakness. I mean, the deaf can't hear. And, I mean, to put a stumbling block before the blind, I mean, that's to trip them up. And the thing as believers, you know what? When we see someone sh dealing with a certain weakness, whether it's physical or maybe they're a younger believer, you know what we need to be doing? We need to be finding a way to build a bridge to them. And that we're finding a way to love them. And that, you know what, one of the things that's really sad, it, one of the things I found out is that uh, I met this missionary. He, he preaches to the blind. He has a ministry to the blind. It's really cool. And I, I don't even know how you could preach, you know, um, you know, with someone who can't hear or who can't see. And the thing is, one of the things he said is there's not a lot of people ministering to these people who have this weakness. There's not a lot of people who feel called to go. And the thing is, as believers, we need to be looking that these people are hearing the gospel as well. Hearing God's word constantly. Because often they get shoved under the rug, and sometimes I don't even think we realize it. They don't come to church because, well, I mean, if I can't hear, why would I go? If I can't see, why would I go? And there's so many other weaknesses. I mean, if there's a believer that you know who has a weakness, either physical or spiritual, be figuring out, how do I love them? How do I love them in their weakness? How do I show kindness to them? And because honestly, we're, sometimes I feel uncomfortable around certain people who have those weaknesses because you're like, how do I interact with them? But the thing is, we need to be going to them and showing love. Not taking advantage of them, but showing love. 
And then in verses 15 through 16, we see that man, justice, that there should, it says in verse 16, you shall not do no injustice in judgment. Judgment must be held in a completely righteous Manner. And the first thing it says in verse 15 is that you shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor uh, to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. You know, if you need to learn about partiality, go to the book of James, chapter 2. It talks about how, you know, you have the rich man come into the church and man, everyone is all about this guy. Make sure he has the best seat. Man, that he gets the, the best spot, you know, so he can hear the pastor the best. And actually, since we're back row Baptists, a lot of us, maybe he sits in the back. Who knows? But then it talks about the poor man coming in. And guess what? I mean, make sure you sit off to the side. Or, you know, you can sit at my feet. Partiality was shown. And what God is saying here is that in judgment, while justice needs to be carried out, guess what? Make sure that the poor man, that there's no partiality against him. Because, you know, often in society, we see that the rich get out because, you know what? They had enough money. They had the right connections. And the thing is, what God is saying is that, you know what, the, to the people of Israel, the poor and the mighty need to be judged at the same level. They need to be judged without partiality. In righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. And then it continues on to verse 16, what judgment looks like. You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. What God is saying is that you should not be a gossip. You know, pastor has been telling me a certain joke quite often. This came from one of his teachers. He says, you know what? How about we confess our sins to one another? Mine is gossip. What's yours? You know, gossip is a very dangerous sin. And that, guess what? We see in this passage that it doesn't bring about justice. We have someone who's telling tales. And actually goes so far, it says, you shall not take a stand against the life of your neighbor. That what this person is saying is false. And guess what? The per his neighbor, his life is at stake. And the thing is, often we don't realize that we're gossiping. Sometimes I think we kind of suppress it like, you know, we're talking about someone. And, you know, maybe we give a poor image about that person to somebody else. And guess what? You know what that person who we're talking to is? Guess what? That image gets ingrained with, into their head. They think poorly of that person because of what you said. God calls that we not be talebearers, a gossip, and not to take a stand against the life of your neighbor. And in connection with the other verse, you know that we don't show partiality to one another. You know, it's super easy to think, you know, a lot of us like to think that we're super Christians. That, you know, we have life all figured out. And you know what? That other people... Man, they're not on the same level as I am. And especially with new believers. You know, just take a look at business meetings. Sometimes you hear that one person talking, and you're like, oh man, why are they the ones speaking? They don't know what they're talking about. And we don't want them to be heard. Man, and even just in how we interact with people, we get, sometimes we can easily get into clicks on our churches, don't we? Man, that person is just like me. Man, I love being around that person. Man, but we have someone new come to the church, and you know what? They're different from us, and you know what? Sometimes we don't show love. And sometimes it's not even that I go up to that person and tell them, I'm really angry with you, or I'm very bitter, or I don't want you here. Man, but we keep our distance. You know what? I'm going to go back to the people who I'm comfortable with. God calls His people, all of His people, to love one another. And you know, Jesus showed a great example in that he said, you know what? You know what? It's normal for the world that you love the people who love you back. He says it's super normal. I mean, man, if you love your family or if there's certain friends you hang around, man, it's super easy to show love, to show non-partiality to them. Man, but God, Jesus says, you know what? You, you even need to love your enemies. 
He needed to even love those who, guess what, aren't going to show love back. There should be no partiality and justice in how we deal with people. We're not to be a gossip against them. And in verses 17 and 18, see, a lot of the times we, we think that the Old Testament didn't care about the heart. We, we say, you know, the Old Testament is all about these rules, just what, and that, you know, God cared about just about outward appearance. But the thing is, in these verses, we see that God actually directs the people to think inwardly. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. This is a very strange command to the people of Israel because a lot of the things that God has commanded them in Leviticus, they were supposed to be outwardly doing. But here, man, no one would know if, if, you were, if you were bitter, if you were angry, or if you hated your brother, right? Well, the thing is, God knew. And actually, Jesus says if anyone has hated anyone in his heart, he's committed murder. And we see here that, see that God is saying, you shall not hate your brother even in your heart. So they weren't supposed to even just put on this facade that I'm being kind to people, that I'm showing respect to people. But even in their hearts, they were not to be bitter or angry or hateful against somebody. And then we get into the end of verse 17. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Okay, we've been talking about love. Man, this doesn't seem very loving, is it? Man, that word rebuking. Well, this word rebuking has the idea of correcting. It's not like one Israelite is supposed to go to another other Israelite and man, just really let him have it. Man, he messed up big time. But the thing is, all of Israel is supposed to know God's law. And you know what? They were supposed to keep each other accountable to that law. You know, I'm a, I'm a guy that, you know what, I don't like conflict very much. I don't like to walk up to people and tell them, guess what, you're wrong. <laughs> it's not very fun, right? And the thing is, God calls us to do that in love. But the thing is, you know what sometimes the most loving thing is? Correcting your brother when he's walking away from God. When he's sinning, when he's living in sin. You know, if an Israelite was seeing someone wandering from God's law, they were supposed to correct him. And you know what? We need to be looking out for that. And the thing is, and I might have to save it for next week, chapter 20, it talks a lot about punishment for those who don't obey the law. And some of these punishments are severe because sin is severe. And the thing is, the people of Israel are supposed to be working together to make sure they stay a holy nation. Too often we're individualistic in our thinking that, you know what, as long as I care about my holiness, I'm good. You know what, should you care about your holiness? Yes. But God says you need to be looking out even for others. And that, man, if they're walking in a way they, should, they shouldn't be going, you are to correct them. But the thing is, in verse 18, it describes what you shouldn't do if a, brother's, uh, if, if a brother wrongs you, even in a sinful way. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. You know, sometimes when people sin, or even when they don't sin, we just feel like we've been wronged in some way. Man, we hold on to that. Whenever I see so-and-so, man, I'm not happy with that person. Man, I am bitter. Man, and if I could just let them have it, I would. And sometimes we're like, man, we just want to take it into our own hands. And man, if they could just learn a lesson. And you know, sometimes we think if, man, if I just suppress it in my heart, you know, no one knows about it. Man, then okay, I, I'm not disobeying God. But the thing is, we should be a people that don't hold on to bitterness and grudges. A people that, man, I see something somebody else is doing, and even if it is a sin that I'm not holding and being bitter against that person. You know, we, I mentioned Romans 12, Romans 12 earlier, and one of the verses says, Be at peace with all men as much as depends on you. You know what we like to think? Man, that person didn't ask for forgiveness. They need to come to me first. Man, if I seek forgiveness, if I seek reconciliation, if I seek peace with this person, you know what? They're not going to show it back. 
They're not going to care. But the thing is, God says that he is the judge. He's the one who takes vengeance on those who do wrong. And we're supposed to leave it up to God. And as much as depends on you, you are to love people and be at peace with them. So you might not be at peace because the other person doesn't want peace, but you are to be in a state of ready for, ready for that state of peace. So, so you're ready to be at peace with that person. You need to show love to that person even if they don't show it back. Leave judgment to God. Then in verse 19, it says, You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your livestock breed with another kind. You shall not sow your field with mixed seed, nor shall a garment of mixed linen and wool come upon you. Now, this is one of those weird verses in Leviticus. You're kind of reading that, and you're just like, so can't have mixed cloth in your clothing, your livestock. You know, I've been learning a lot about dairy cows recently, and that, you know, they would breed them together so that, you know, they produce the most milk. You couldn't have done that in ancient Israel. You know, we see that even in their fields, they're not supposed to be mixing seeds like a mixed crop. And, you know, the question is, okay, why weren't they allowed to do this? And, you know, I, I was looking through it, and it's not, it's not connected to anything pagan. Okay, it's not connected to anything pagan. So it's like, okay, uh, is it something so that they have healthy crops, I know, good clothing, good, strong cows? And the answer is no. And the thing is, I walked away from this verse. I don't know why God gave this command. But the thing is, I appreciated one of my commentators. He said, you know what? God divided the two. He said, you know what? Your clothing, it's not, it's not supposed to be mixed at all. Your fields aren't supposed to be mixed at all. Your livestock are not supposed to be in mixed breeding. And because God said it, that was how it was supposed to be. We should never question any of God's commandments. You know, it's super easy. Sometimes God asks believers hard things to do. And it might not be exactly like this law, but you know, we talked about loving another person. Sometimes that's really hard to do. And we try and justify why I shouldn't have to do it. And you know, maybe the people of Israel are like trying to justify why they wouldn't have to obey this command. But the thing is, if God said it, there's no questions about it. We are to do it. Then we get to verses 20 through 22. Whoever lies carnally with a woman who is betrothed to a man as a concubine and who has not at all been redeemed nor given her freedom, for this there shall be scourging, uh, scourging, but they shall not be put to death because she was not free. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, a ram as a trespass offering. The priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering before the Lord for his sin, which he has committed. And the sin which he has committed shall be forgiven him. So in Leviticus, we finally run across the topic of slavery. And as I was studying this verse, it's kind of a hard verse. One of my co-workers one day, I, I heard him actually say this. He said, you know what? The Bible's evil. Because guess what? It condones slavery. And actually what's going on, it talks about this woman not being free. And actually, fun fact, this is the first time the word redeemed comes up. So a little trivia fact for you. And it's like, what's going on here? Because usually if man, a man's laying with another man's woman, he was to be put to death. We see in chapter 20 that the punishment for idolatry is that they were to be put to death because of that sin. So it's like, what, because this, this woman is, is a slave? She, she, the, there isn't the same punishment? And one of the things we have to realize is that already this slave lady is already getting a much better tre treatment than any of the other nations. And the other nations, she could be mistreated without, without any punishment on those who did it. God is already showing much more kindness than any of the other nations. She's protected in that. Guess what? He still has sinned. And the thing is, we're actually going to come back to this passage. So I'm going to talk a little bit about slavery. 
just a tad bit, but it actually comes up a lot more prominent in chapter 25. So if you want to study ahead on slavery in the Bible, go be free to do that. But the thing is, we got to remember, as, as we're thinking about slavery in the Bible, it's not the same as American slavery. It's actually not the same at all. Actually, what the U.S. did with their slaves, actually, that is condemned in the Bible and punishable by death by all those who participated in it. And slavery, what's often happening in Scripture is that this is someone who, man, they couldn't pay their debts. This is someone who wasn't able to afford to provide for themselves. So guess what? They would go under a master so that they would have a roof over their head, so that they would have food. And this was a way that God actually provided for the people of Israel so that these people wouldn't be left to starve on their own. And they could eventually find freedom. As we even see, um, it mentions the word redeemed, bought out of slavery. And so we're going to dive into these verses a little bit more, but we're going to get to 25, and we're going to explain what does biblical slavery look like. God had a plan, and we got to be careful that we're not justifying what God's doing. Someone said, once said, you know, and uh, I th- I'm trying to remember if he was a commentator, but he was someone who knew about God's word, and he was talking about, and he, and he was like, you know what, slavery, the only reason God has laws and rules about it is because, you know what, he knew the people of Israel were going to going to indulge in slavery, commit the sin of slavery, and you know what? God just made laws just to make sure it wasn't as bad as it possibly could be. And the thing is, I think if we look at the book of Leviticus, God never has a problem with saying to the people of Israel, don't do this. Be holy. Be set apart. And he doesn't want any sin to be among the people. We don't need to justify what God's doing, but we need to see how God's goodness is being shown here. How he's making the, showing that the people are to be holy and loving, even in slavery. And so we'll talk about that more later. So, but you guys can be thinking on that ahead of time. So verses 23 through 25. So when you come into the land and have planted all kinds of trees for food, then, shall, uh, then you shall count the fruit as uncircumcised. Three years it shall be as uncircumcised to you. It shall not be eaten. But in the fourth year, all of its fruit shall be holy, a praise to the Lord. And in the fifth year, you may eat it, its fruit, that it may yield to you its increase. I I am the Lord your God. Here's another law. It's like, okay, why can't they eat of the fruit for like the first three years? I mean, think of the people of Israel. You know, they're in the land. This is a law for right when the people of Israel get into the land. And, you know, you plant this tree or any kind of um, vegetation that produced fruit. And imagine it just sitting there for three years. There's fruit on it. And you're like, man, I would really like to have that fruit. But the thing is, they were supposed to wait. They were supposed to wait. And it says in the fourth year, it says in the fourth year, but in the fourth year, all true fruit shall be holy. It's no longer defiled. It's no longer uncircumcised. A praise to the Lord. God wanted the people of Israel as they're coming into the land to remember what God is giving them. That this is to be dedicated to the Lord. A lot of times the Lord puts these commands in so that the people of Israel are reminded of, reminded of what God is doing. It wasn't the people of Israel who brought themselves to this land and are providing for themselves. It is the Lord. And they're dedicated to the Lord. But then in the fifth year, they're allowed to eat of the increase. And in verses 26 through 28, this, now this gets into some pagan rituals. You shall not eat anything with the blood, nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. So we talked about that, uh, that God has set blood apart, that the people of Israel were not supposed to eat it because they were supposed to remember that, you know what? This blood, God is, there's life in the blood, and that God has given blood as a sacrifice to be something for purification, for your atonement, for the covering of sins. And that was the purpose of blood. And the people of Israel are not supposed to eat it. 
And then we get into, nor practice divination or soothsaying. This is the idea that, you know, a lot of divination or soothsaying, what it's getting after is that, you know what, you're not supposed to be looking for things in the future through other means. Revelation outside of God. God has all the answers, and God is going to tell the people of Israel what they're going to need and what they're supposed to do. And they're supposed to walk by faith when God's maybe not talking to them at that moment of time and rely on God's word and what he has given to them. They're not supposed to be going into these, to these false prophets to figure out what's going to happen in the future or what they're supposed to do. We see Saul make this mistake. We see that he wasn't following the Lord, and when the Lord doesn't answer him because Saul is in sin, he goes to this woman. And she's the one who's practicing divination. And she, he's like, man, can you raise Samuel from the dead? Because you know what? He knows how to fix all this mess. And the thing is, he was looking for revelation. He was looking for the answers outside of God. Yes, he might have went to a man of God, but he was looking for the answers in a way outside of God. He wasn't going to him directly. He didn't seek forgiveness. And then it gets into verse 27 and 28. You shall not shave around the sides of your head, nor shall you disfigure the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. Now, as I was looking up this, one of the questions that popped up on the internet, does the Bible have something against haircuts? It doesn't. What's going on here is that God's saying, you know what? Don't look like those who are practicing pagan rituals. Because what's going on here, how they would cut their hair, their cutting of their skin, which they said is for the dead, it's a pagan ritual practice. And then we come to this wonderful word, tattoo. There's a big debate on that, isn't there? And a lot of people have used this verse as, you know what, you shouldn't have tattoos. God said not to. And there's the other people who say, well, this is the law, so we're not supposed to obey that anymore. So there's nothing we can learn here. I think there is something we can learn here. Now, we do have to be careful that the tattoos that God's talking about this time is connected to pagan rituals. Most of the tattoos we have today are not connected to pagan rituals. So it doesn't quite apply. But the thing is, we can't say it doesn't completely apply. Because you know what? The tattoos, tattoos often look like, they look like the world. Now, not all tattoos do. But the thing is, we don't realize that when you're putting a tattoo on, a lot of young people don't realize what they're doing is that they're permanently marking their skin. Yes, there is a way to remove, that, remove it, but a lot of people don't because that scars you. The thing is, a lot of people put these tattoos, and you know what? That becomes your, a part of your identity, who you are. And you know, a lot of people have so many tattoos so that they stand out. They fit into a certain crowd. You know what? We shouldn't want to look like the world. Now, I'm not saying tattoos are wrong or bad. Each man needs to be convinced in his own mind on how to deal with that issue. I, I know, I've known people that get a tattoo of just one verse. Some people have gotten a tattoo of a ring so that, you know what? They work in a factory, and guess what? Now they're not going to lose their, their wedding ring. And there's a lot of ways to think about it. But you know what? A lot of people don't think about, do I look like how the world dresses? How the world has marked themselves up? up? Do I look like worldliness? People don't think that way. People don't think, do I look like the world? Even in what we wear and how, and how we... Um, you know, comb our hair, how we do our haircuts, you know, whether you put tattoos, piercings, or anything, even those things can honor and glorify God. We shouldn't want to just look like the world just so that we fit in. Then we get to verse 29. Do not prostitute your daughter to cause her to be a harlot, lest the land fall into har harlotry and the land become full of wickedness. 
So what's going on here? It seems like in some way the father has put his daughter into a situation where she's a prostitute. She's a harlot. And it's kind of hard to tell exactly what's going on because in this verse and actually even in the Hebrew language, it doesn't connect it to a pagan ritual at all. But the good chance is that it could be. That it is connected in some way to a pagan ritual. Or in some way, maybe the father is getting some advantage or even some money from having his daughter as a prostitute. But the thing is, God's like, this shouldn't be so. Lest the land be filled with harlotry and the land become full of wickedness. And the thing is, we see this with the people of Israel, that there is harlots in the land, and the, the prophets speak against this. And because of the harlotry going around in Israel, that we see that wickedness comes in as well. And the thing is, as I was thinking about this verse, like, I mean, how does this even apply to us today as believers? And the thing is, I think Israel was supposed to see that, you know what, this, this sin, man, parents, don't have your, don't be passing the sin on to your kids. And a lot of people think that their sin just affects them. I've seen a lot of people who get into pornography, and they think that only affects me. Man, but if your kids see that, man, they might get, they, they might go into sexual immorality as well. And are they accountable for their sin? Yes. But parents are called to righteousness and how they lead their kids, and this is true of any sin. And that we got to realize that our sins don't just affect us. Now we come to verse 30. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. You know, God is saying that, you know what, you shall keep my Sabbath day. It says, you know, all the way back in Genesis that God had set apart the Sabbath day. Because it was a day of completeness when the creation work was done. And it was a day that the people of Israel were to worship God. A day they were to dedicate to Him. You know, as I was thinking of this, do we have that for Sunday? Are we distracted? A lot of times the world has all these activities and events going on. But is Sunday a day that we dedicate to thinking to the Lord? See, the Sabbath isn't for us today. It would have been a Saturday, the end of the week. But do we have a time where we're thinking on things of God? That we set a, set a time away from work. That we set a time so that we can be thinking on what God has done for us. And he says, in reverence for my sanctuary, God says that your body is the temple of the Lord. Make sure you that, ma'am, that we don't fill our, our bodies with sin. And we see the people of Israel eventually break this commandment in that their physical temple. We're going through the book of Ezekiel for Sunday school. We actually see the people of Israel defile the temple, the sanctuary where God was at. It is a serious sin. And God says, your body is a temple because you know that's where the Holy Spirit dwells. Do not defile it. And then verse 31 says, Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. This is going back to don't be seeking revelation outside of God. Any answers outside of Him, only go to God. And then in some of the final verses, it talks about how we are to deal with people again. You shall rise before the gray headed and honor the presence of the old man and fear your God. Kids, I'm going to look at you real quick. You might notice there's some gray hairs around. You know what, kids? You know, sometimes we often like, I don't know how to relate to older people. But guess what? God says you need to honor them. This is kind of the same idea as honor your parents. God has given them a special place in your life. And that you are to honor them. I mean, you should talk to some of the older folks. I mean, make sure that, you know what, if they're struggling, sometimes, as definitely as people get a little bit older, they're going to struggle even, even getting the door open, holding up for them, making sure that, you know, maybe you carry their plate because they got a cane. You need to revere, it says, the old man, the one with gray hair. 
And then verse 33 and 34. And if a stranger dwells with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him. The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you. And you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You know what? God's saying, you know what? The person who dwells outside your land, if he is among you, treat him with the same love that you are to be treating one another. And he points back to Egypt. Do you remember how you were mistreated in Egypt and taken into slavery? Don't do the same. Don't do the same. You know what? When people come through our church drawers, we should be showing them love. I mean, even if they seem, like, different. Like, you know, there's some people that come into our church doors that, man, they don't seem like they fit into our church culture at all. And we need to be showing love towards them. And we even need to be thinking of Jesus' love towards us in that same way. Because you're like, well, you know, maybe I'd rather just stay away from that person. I mean, it says, you know, in the Bible, they're strangers. They're from a foreign place. And it's hard to show love towards one, one another at times. But the thing is, think of how God showed love towards you. He didn't wait for you to love Him back. He didn't wait for you to meet the perfect standard. But He showed love even when you were rebelling against Him. And then verses 35 through 36, we get back into this idea of integrity. It says, have honest scales, have honest weights. Guess what? You know, don't make sure that your, your weights are fake so that the product seems a little bit heavier and worth a little bit more money than it was. You're supposed to deal honestly with one another. And I was planning on going to chapter 20, but it's getting a little bit long. There's a lot of things going on in this passage. And God has called that he, that we are to love him and to love others. And how we love God is that we show it by holy living, that we're set apart from the things of the world. And how we love others is by honest living, that we care for them and that we show integrity with those around us. And I'm going to give you kind of a strange application, a little strange request. It's actually an assignment for you guys sometime in the next couple of weeks. That with your families, you take a look at this passage and see how do we have good communion with those around us and good fellowship with God. Because it's what this chapter 19 is looking at. Man, how do you have a good relationship with those around you? How do you show love towards them? How do you show love towards God? How do you show love to community? How do we show love to one another? And I would encourage you to get with your families and look at these verses and like, how as a family, what verses do we need to apply here? Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much, Lord, for the law you've given us so that it's a guide in how we can love you and love others. Lord, thank you for not leaving us in the darkness in that. Lord, and I pray as we leave today, Lord, we be thinking, how am I showing love? Lord, how am I being set apart from the world in how I love? Lord, you said the two greatest commandments was to love you and to love others. Help us to be doing that. Lord, help us to be separate from the world and that we would even love those who don't love us back. Lord, thank you. And in Jesus' name, amen.